Welcome to this initial session for uh, the apps overview, so the Caris apps overview. So I will just start very briefly with an overview uh, of the apps, and then I will go straight into the real thing and show you how everything works uh, in real life. As you likely everyone already know, the apps are our completely automated end-to-end -end solution for particular source systems. At the moment, we have six out there, uh, an app for Zero, Workflow Max, QuickBooks, MYOB, HubSpot, and Dia. So these are at the moment released. There's a few more in the making. And again, I would be interested in your feedback in your particular region. What are other source systems that could be relevant? So an end-to-end -end solution from initial data warehouse creation, PowerPoint model to planning environment. So the agenda today is initially just covering a very quick overview of what are apps, uh, then going through the onboarding process, connecting to uh, the different app sources, the new application settings, the Power BI apps, Excel templates, and then typical requirements that happen in this process when you're working with apps customer. So, of course, one of the main ones, consolidation, currency conversion, mappings in all shape and forms, typically around accounts, but there's also a wide variety of other areas where customers and users want to map their dimensions in a different way, be it products, customers, anything. Then the reporting options, and then finally, uh, planning with the apps. So what are the challenges? Again, likely for most of you, very clear. Just go very quickly over it again. So for these users that are using uh, these cloud-based systems, typically very hard to get a holistic overview of the different solutions. Um, they have very limited foresight, so they might get in more or less uh, useful reports, what's going on, but they have very little uh, option to project into the future. Typically, processes are very inefficient um, when they're working with these solutions. The old spreadsheet problem, they copy and paste data into Excel with all the related issues. Uh, there's no workflows, there's very limited uh, integration with uh, office productivity. So, all these are the the typical issues that the apps customers are facing. And then what's the benefit? I guess most of you will already be familiar with this. So having a optimal data warehouse, data model in place. Uh, on the one hand, the, the data warehouse, the relational data warehouse, but then also the, uh, the Power BI model with the relevant uh, relationships, um, calculation logic, and other modeling. Um, details, then the option to uh, pretty much immediately within a few minutes have interactive dashboards that uh, have a read-write option in Power BI and in Excel, automated statutory consolidation for unlimited, here we have, I'm mentioning zero, but that's obviously possible for all, um, for all apps, although we have to say that the one where it's really at the moment um, the most uh, functional and automated is zero. The other ones require a little bit more uh, manual um, manual work to set this up. And then obviously the, the good old uh, Actaris planning proposition, all the uh, planning features that Actaris offers. Although we have to be honest that this is in comparison to the enterprise, but this is in 90% the key requirements for the apps in many cases is not a requirement. They're already very happy if they get the reporting uh, features and the dashboards and the consolidation done. So this is uh, the, the, the quick overview. Again, you're all familiar the way it works is you connect your source system, you automatically build the data warehouse. Actually, this is not involving uh, instant link. Instant link is the one for the generic one, but instant link is also available in this process. Um, and then the reports, dashboards, uh, planning templates out of the box in, in Power BI and in Excel, these are typically the two that are relevant. 
again, from our experience uh, at the moment, 90% using Power BI, although they, although they have the option of Excel that is typically doing you know very similar things, not as nice and shiny and interactive as Power BI, but from a general consolidation perspective, reporting perspective, Excel offers the same thing. Just shows again how relevant this Power BI environment is. So this is the theory. Any questions around this so far before I go into the practical side of things? So with the uh, onboarding and this getting started, I guess most of you are familiar with that aspect of the system as well. I just quickly got to throw it again. So uh, you start by providing your prospect with a link that is a carries forward slash onboarding. And then you just take them through the process, collecting the their details. Uh, the important thing here was still, although there's a lot of validations here, you, you wouldn't believe how complex this process was to set up. It took us two years to get it right because there's so many complexities, so many things that go wrong uh, that came up. But by now it is pretty uh, reliable. So with the database name, that's just a simple name, so we, we, we typically recommend a single word, no spaces, no other special characters, although we're dealing now with it. So if people are doing this and using spaces and things that they shouldn't, uh, the system here will already warn them. The legal name, the, uh, the country, uh, the telephone number, and then the city. So you see again here, this needs to be unique their database name because that's in the end their username as well that's the the administrator username and that's the database name and that's they're all in the pool this needs to be unique so this process checks also if this database name is already used then they just select the industry uh, agree to the terms if they want to become a partner they can tick this box and then this automatically uh, provides them creates the environment and provides them the administrator user. The administrator user is always the database name that they've chosen at carriesandmicrosoft.com. And what this will kick off now is this will send them an email with an activation link that's obviously necessary so that we can confirm that the email address that they have used is correct. So I'm getting now an email to the email folder that I've used with this um, activation email with the activation link so that looks like this thank you for starting the trial and this is click this link and this will now uh, set up their database which typically takes half a minute to a minute to set everything up so what this is doing now is it creates the azure sql database and it creates their environment initially obviously completely empty there's nothing there's nothing in there uh, what you can typically already do is you can um, log on to the system even if, if this is still in the process of getting created so if you wait half a minute that's typically enough you can already click on the top uh, on the logo here sign in and then you can sign in with this new account The password now that they need is in the email. So they have to go to the email and then here they have their password. This is the temporary password that was generated for them. They just copy and paste this and log on. Then they just paste this again and put in their own password. And this is it. So this is what normally should happen. They get their, uh, this initial wizard that explains everything. So our key value proposition Cookies time to value, uh, flexibility, so the business users are in charge and can and can adapt everything exactly to their needs and then smart in and foresight. So, you know, having intelligent support to see what's going on and then also um, prepare for the future. Uh, then we have the database details here. So this is now all the relevant details to access their database, the server name at the moment. By default, there's only the the, the default that carries pool. This will change soon where we have regional pools. So if uh, you have a customer in Europe, they will have their own European pool. So this will be a carries EU for Europe. 
database windows.net, uh, US will stay that way and Asia will likely be Hectares uh, AS for Asia. Um, so that at the moment is always the same, but this will this will change because we have so many customers now. And then there's also regional requirements. For example, customers in Germany are not too happy to have their data stored outside Europe or in customers in Europe in general. So this this will be region specific. Then we have the database name, which is just AP always underscore. So this is always the Actaris database name, AP underscore, and then the name of the database that they chose. And then we have the, the username, which is again the same thing, you, um, database name plus Actaris and Microsoft.com. What is important is obviously when they want to access the database, they have to add the IP address to the safe list, and they can do this directly here by clicking on this. So now the IP address is on the safe list. It is exactly the same functionality that they can also do in the safe IP address here. The next step is then, and as I see here, we have to update this because we have now three other connectors. So it's a bit unfair that Myop, uh, Deer, and HubSpot are not listed here, um, which again, I think is uh, underway, but not yet deployed. So here you can directly connect to the particular source system and for example, add a zero company. So you just click on add, log on with your username. Now you have to go through the authentication procedures. This is an, uh, a zero thing. This depends on the underlying source system. This has nothing to do with, with us. And this is it. So now you can select your company here. So here we see now this zero entity is now added to Actaris. So all the data for the last six months. So the initial update is always for zero six months. Will get loaded into the Azure SQL database. And you can see that's still running here. Uh, this will take, depending on the data, more or less time. This can take a long time so if there's customers with massive um, databases that have tens of thousands of transactions, invoices, contacts, whatever it is. This can take some time. Um, and so this will create now the, uh, the initial tables for um, for their for their system. So in this case for zero. So while this is loading, I just quickly show you what the structure looks like because this is important to understand. We see now all the tables that are in this model. And there's the important thing to understand is we have two schemas, two types of information. We have the all up scheme schema. This is our own one. This is a star schema data warehouse that the users can fully edit. And then we also have always the particular app source system there as well. In, if you are familiar with data warehouse concepts, these are in essence staging tables. So these the users can't touch. They will always be populated as per the source system and the users shouldn't touch them and shouldn't change them. So this is the, this is the truth. Whereas this one, obviously the users can change it. Um, so that's important to understand. The other thing is here we have by default every single record. So every invoice, every contact, every payment, whatever it is, is in here. Whereas the all up tables, the, the cube is typically a summary model that you can already see here is on a on a monthly basis. So here the the, the detailed data on the transaction level gets aggregated because typically for planning purposes, and this is what this is typically used for, you don't need the details. And if you need the details with our approach in Power BI, uh, if you have the detail, you can immediately link them. So if you have the cube where you have summary data, but if you really want the transactions, you just you know create a, a custom tool tip, uh, uh, another visual on the same report that gives you the details uh, from the detail table. So it's not really necessary to have this high granularity here in the all-up schema. So this is now what's uh, getting created. So it, it's now uh, loading the data into these, in this case, zero tables. 
And then once the data in the zero table is finished, it will run a process to create all the OLAP databases. It will automatically create the, the cube that is then visible in the in the model. At the moment, we will likely not see anything because it's still working. You can see at the moment, we only have two dimensions and these are standard dimensions for month and currency that are always the same for zeros. They get created, but the specific ones, we have to wait until the initial load is finished. So while this is loading, a few new things here that likely most of you haven't seen. So we have now, when we go through the wizard, I'll just go through the wizard again, because um, with the wizard, if you don't go through it, but add a data source, the wizard stops. But if you don't add the data source directly in the wizard, um, it, there are a few more steps. So, so you, you can go over this one here. You can say other skip or next. Then you go to the next step of the wizard. So here we're explaining the source tables, so in this case, the zero ones and the OLAP tables, what the difference is. So that one is right back, the other one is uh, full detail, non-editable. Then we have the components, so the, the Power BI app, the visuals and the Excel add-ins. So here with these buttons, you can directly download these components if you want to from here. Uh, the explanation of our software, the software enabled service model, to be honest, hasn't really taken off so far. I still believe this is where we will be going through. And this is also the attractive proposition for US partners that um, you can use us just as a platform to sell your services. So you would then create a package, whatever it's called, uh, analytic support, uh, planning uh, package, whatever, where you, in combination with the carries, sell your own package to them. So you have a software enabled service uh, that enables you to get recurring income and move away from the typically project based business. So this is explained here. So what they should see here is this one, the currency settings. So they should be able to select their group currency uh, and then the currencies that they want to work with. So in our case, uh, it would be AUD. It's the group currency and then we uh, have um, conversions into US dollars into euros and it's I guess for us at the moment that's what it is. So we have these uh, settings for what's the group currency and what are the currencies that you want to translate to. And then what you can do as well is you can select the start date. So what this does, this step is it automatically creates a foreign exchange table. So if I select for example here 2020 uh, January uh, and then click on save, the system will automatically create a, a table with all currency conversions from Australian dollars to Euro and US dollars from the first of the first 2020 onwards. Yeah, And this is then what we're using in our currency conversions. So if you, when you're using the consolidation features and the, uh, the automated currency conversion, you need to go through this process so that the tables that we give you in Power BI, or the, which are in the end views, they create the calculations to convert local currencies into the group currency based on the settings here. And if you don't populate them, if they're all empty, then your uh, group currency uh, fields will be empty as well. So that's important to, to keep in mind. Uh, the other thing, um, and that's also new, is we have now app specific calendars. So you can now set up how you want to handle your calendar. So for example, again, in this, in this case, if we choose January 2020 as a starting point, and I want to, let's say, predict until 2023 uh, December, I can just select the date range here and then also specify my financial uh, start period. So in, in Australia, it's seven, so July. So this means it will uh, automatically create all the um, all the aggregations to manage the uh, hierarchies for financial periods correctly. So if I just click here now on generate, it will generate this 
calendar for the particular app. So if we look at this in the back end, we have the zero calendar table, which is this one here. And that is driven by these settings that we've just uh, maintained here. So you see that's now um, the table and we can see that the financial periods are handled correctly here. So in, then in the front end side, if I want to select, okay, financial month seven or financial year 1920, it will automatically give me the correct aggregations based on these settings here. The last thing that's also new for likely all of you, or most of you, some might have seen it already, is the email details. Um, what we have added now in the new version, but it's, it's already deployed, is the option to manage your refreshes directly from the user side. Previously, you had to send an email to support that you want to set up the refresh for a particular company at a particular time. This is not something that you can do directly from the front end side. And this is a setting where you can specify how detailed you want notifications to be. So when you do your refresh and something goes wrong, so for example, the zero API is not available or whatever else is not as it should, uh, you can specify here that when an error happens, I want to get a notification, or you could say any message, and this is also just sending a message that you know the refresh went through uh, without errors. Uh, you will, you will then get this message after every refresh and the refresh itself you can set up in the admin menu there's this new connector scheduler option where you select your the, your time zone where you are for example if in europe i think in continentally it's utc plus one so you select your time so that when you set the time this is according to your particular time zone so you set this uh, uh, this time zone and then you just click on add, uh, select your app types. So in this case, it's zero. You specify when do you want it to be executed. So let's say we want this to be at uh, midnight, uh, 30 minutes after midnight. And then you can select uh, all the tables that you want to automatically update. Typically, it's a good idea to uh, do this for all, but there could also be a reason that it's not necessary. And obviously, this will take time. The more you tick here, the more will need to be refreshed. So if you don't need it, you can tick it off here. If you want to completely turn it off, you can turn it off here with this active toggle here on the top left. So this is the new user-based scheduler option. Let's see if the other one is finished now. Yeah, so we see now that is finished. So it has imported the data now from uh, August 24 to uh, February 24 of the following year. So six months of data for this company were imported. What you can do now, this is the same for all connectors, you can now add additional history. So if you want to add now more history, you can just click on the start date. Normally what I do is I take the start date of the previous process. In this case, it would be August 24 or August 23 actually to be precise. So August 23, 2020. Uh, 23. I mean, it doesn't really matter. So, for example, if you uh, load the same data again and again, it has no harm done. We'll, we'll just override it. Um, and then you go back at a maximum one year before that. So, I could go to uh, August 24 of 19. Yeah. So zero, and this is not us, this is zero. The API only allows you to do a certain number of records, and that's typically within a year. We don't know, and no one knows beforehand uh, how much it is, but one year we can typically handle it. That's why we're having this restriction. If you try to put something in that is not possible, so if I put in here 2015, and you try this, it, it will tell you that this is too long. So you see here, you cannot select a range of dates over one year. So we are capturing these errors automatically and uh, you know it wouldn't allow you anyway. So 
Uh, now, this was the most important steps. If you want to, you can then explain the users what I've just explained. Okay, this was the zero data. This is the all up data, and the all up data is always visible in the in the modeler. So that that corresponds to all the tables in the all up format. So if we do a refresh on this now after the data has now been finished, we will see the same uh, all up tables in in this. Um, in this list. Uh, so here we see now exactly the tables, so all of account, all of contact, and so on. They correspond to the to the tables here. With the option now that you can now uh, edit everything here. So you have your tables here. You see the key is always a combination of, in, in the case of zero, organization, account uh, code, and account name. With the name, as you likely know, in Nectaris and everywhere in the data warehouse, this needs to be unique. The mention table needs to have a unique uh, identifier, and this is the name here for us. But then you have all these items also as separate columns here, and you have then the option to edit all this as you want to. Uh, one thing that is care that we, it's it's important to uh, make clear to the users if they start changing things here. This is something that they shouldn't do. At the moment, we allow it, I think. Let me see if we, yeah. We allow this, we shouldn't. Uh, because on the next refresh cycle, this will be gone. Because these standard columns in the app model, zero will brutally overwrite. So it doesn't care that you have changed this one. On the next cycle, it will be gone. If you want to have something that persists, you need to put your own one in here. So if, if I put in here the a mapping column, in there you can then do what you want. And this will stay. Yeah. Um, so this is a good uh, way to demonstrate this. And this brings me to our so that one of the topics that we had on the list the mapping. So if you want, if your users want to map their accounts differently, this is the way to do it. And that's one way, but the better way typically for that to handle is the Excel add-in. So um, you can go through with them in the in the process and they install the Excel add-in, they log on with the user. And you can do the editing directly here. So I'm not connected, and then uh, you can explain the the add-in. So this is typically for the uh, import functionality, planning, uploading data, copying data, sending reports, but then also the editing of the dimensions. So they can do the modeling directly in Excel. They just choose the particular dimension account, the one that we were working before. They get now the same dimension that you saw before in in the uh, in the modeler, and now you have the new table here. This is still a lot of overlap from the other one. So here we see another three that we added it, but now you have the the much better editing options directly in in Excel. So you can copy and paste. You can use any Excel functionality, VLOOKUPs, Excel lookups, whatever uh, you want. So any functionality you have here, and then the only thing you do is just press publish changes. It will automatically detect the dimension. That is in use, so it's the same name as the uh, dimension here. And then, if you go back and refresh this, you will see that the new data, your new mapping information, how you map these accounts, is now automatically available here. And that's a typical, typically a, a wow factor for this user. So that covers the the modeling side of things. If you want, you can go through the the cubes as well. So the main one is typically in, in zero is the finance cube that contains the uh, all the financial information, GL information with six dimensions, month account organization, tracking categories. You see uh, what's the database name and what's the actual physical uh, cube name. So it's always cube underscore cube name WB. That's also always uh, default WB for write back. 
Uh, what you can do as well, this is a new feature again that maybe not everyone knows. So you have now the option to directly edit data here as well. This is new. So you can check, choose your dimensions, drag and drop what you want to use, uh, and then can edit directly your, uh, your data here. So for example, if I want to change the exchange rate that I want to work with to 0 0.8 for this period, you can directly override it. Admittedly, the options here are limited, so we don't have any of the more advanced uh, features here but it will automatically do splashing as well. So if you have a splashing uh, level here, it will do the splashing properly, but um, it is obviously not as rich as the front-end functionalities in the other uh, environment. So this is a new thing that you can edit directly in the modeler now, and this is something that for the apps users, and we had again the question yesterday, is, a, is someone uh, that said, ah, you know, I had the I have this exchange rate that comes automatically from McTarris, but I don't want it. I want to have this my own way. No problem. The only way that they have to do is uh, change this to the particular uh, exchange rate that they they need. So this is the uh, the back end side of things, and then typically the next step is the front end side of things. And let's just quickly go through that as well. Uh, as we discussed, for most of them, Excel is the most important one. So we use the uh, Excel option here with the Excel app. You click on that, you click on Get It Now, tick the box, uh, just click forward for these details. It will then uh, automatically log you on to Power BI and create this app. And the app is now, uh, you know, the full blown. Power BI application, so uh, you get the, the Power BI data model, tax calculations, and uh, a full report uh, with you know dashboards, uh, report pages, typically all the relevant uh, details for these systems, and this gets obviously better and better, um, gets, uh, gets automatically created. So you just put in uh, a workspace name, or you can use the one that uh, it gives you automatically, and then it automatically will create this app. So um, I will now just go ahead and just open this. Let me just see if this should, this is a carry. Let's get a zero one. This is a fairly old one, September 22, 2020. Or maybe let's wait until this is finished and we can do it on the latest and greatest last one. So somewhere, somewhere we should see now this new one. Where is it? Maybe here we go. So this is it. So you, you, you just open this then, and then you, you get the app. So this is the, the Power BI dashboard that gets automatically created. Uh, you know, with typical Power BI dashboard functionality, and then you can move through the report. And this is what we what we give you out of the box. So you get all these uh, report pages that cover all these requirements, actual budget comparison, overall performance, sales details, profit and loss, consolidation, data, and so on. I, I will not go into detail here. Just if you're interested, you can go through the same process that I've just gone through, and you will see all this. What's important here now is this is demo data initially. If you want your own data, the only thing that the users have to do is change this to their database name. So it carries one to three click on next, and that will now switch the app from the sample database to their own database. This will take half a minute or so. So the only thing that you have to do in the next step is log on with your Acaris username. This has been also now improved because apps allow you now to, uh, to specify a particular authentication method. Previously, there was the danger that you selected the wrong one. Now it's already automatically on OS2, the correct one. So the only thing you have to do is just sign in, uh, choose the right um, username, so the normal, the one carries admin user, not the Power BI user, obviously. So if companies already have a, a Power BI uh, account, this is not the one to use, they have to use the carries one. And that's it. So now this will um, switch the, the automated reports to their own data. 
This should work in most cases. In some cases, this goes wrong for a variety of reasons. Uh, in, in, in case this happens, um, you have to go to the workspace. So what this is not an app, but an, an app is always linked to a workspace. So um, if you go to the workspace, you will see, let me see if the search works here. Yeah, although this is the report. Anyway, we should see this. So um, this is the report. I wanted to go actually to the workspace. So this is the workspace. And in the workspace, you have now the elements. You have the data set, which is in the end, the connection to the Azure SQL database. You have the Power BI report and you have the Power BI dashboard. And you can now directly edit these things from here. So if the users want to edit things and uh, show here this in a different color, they can directly go there and just change the, the color coding to their, and not just the color coding obviously, but whatever they want. And this will be then automatically applied. So you have now, and this is getting more and more powerful, uh, the better power BI gets, you have now nearly all options. The one big one that's missing is tax calculations. Um, it's on the list, hopefully, I've heard from Microsoft, but um, no more specifics yet defined. So a lot of editing can be done here. You can even create new reports. I normally show quickly, okay, if you want to have a new report, uh, I take the uh, for zero the uh, general ledger and then just do a typical account name Oops. Account name uh, and balance report, and then put a slicer in there, and just to show you, are uh, super flexible, and you can now create the reports as as you want to. So this concludes uh, my uh, presentation. I would just quickly like to hand over to uh, so Michael Snyder. We have two Michaels that are all very experienced with apps: Michael Snyder and Michael Schultz. And uh, I would just quickly invite them invite them to maybe from a practical perspective as they're working day in day out uh, with the apps what are things that um, you feel are important for partners to know that I haven't covered already maybe we start uh, with Michael Schultz yes thanks for that um, that demo Martin um, if we're talking about the 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 apps um, I think Generally, uh, a lot of um, a lot of demand is around the the zero apps. Um, uh, I think one of the, the important things to think about is, you know, if you're talking to accountants, um, you can see that if you say summarize your your balance sheet or your uh, PNL accounts, that you know the totals don't add up to zero. So you need to just uh, consider retained um, earnings calculations, uh, potentially using DAX or um, another way around it. Um, there, there are um, ways to sort that out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, another hint, um, just something that I saw earlier where Martin was working in Excel. Um, and if you got formulas within Excel to, you know, try and populate your uh, dimensions or your, your fact tables, um, just make sure that you've got those formulas saved on another sheet because uh, once you publish it, those formulas do get overwritten. So if you wanted to uh, get them back, then just make sure that you have them, you know, on a separate sheet. Um, yeah, so generally you can change the look and feel of these apps by changing themes. Um, that that is also a very useful way. Uh, you know, not everybody loves the dark background. Somebody, you know, some people like a, a, a lighter background. Um, my recommendation there would be to use PowerPoint as a background. Just build a slide and then bring that in as a background pick. Um, that way you can customize, you know, logos very quickly. Um, so, yeah, so that was just a couple of general hints uh, from my side. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Michael. Hello, guys. Um, I guess <laughs> both Martin and Michael covered most of the things um, that are covered 
that, that are basically customers often ask for. Um, the only thing, again, Martin kind of covered it a little bit, uh, that some very often customers want to group their accounts into certain subgroups. So, for example, we see now a PL with the revenue, and if you open it, we just see the list of accounts. They would have subgroups. And in that case, they would need to, or you as partners would need to go to um, all up account dimension and create basically the groupings for these accounts and just edit this particular app to include it. Um, yeah, look, to be honest, all the, all the things that normally people ask for has been already spoken about. So yeah, that's going to be all for me. Perfect, thanks, Michael. So the final thing is that is also typically very important. So typically a key requirement for these companies is consolidation. So the way uh, you, it works is you add as many companies as you want to from the particular source system, they will then automatically appear here. Um, and the results here without uh, additional configuration will be a management consolidation. So it will just add up the data. So if I select all here, we'll get the total um, of you know all the accounts here. If you want to do a proper management consolidation, there are additional steps necessary. And for that, I would like to quickly introduce Hezam. Hezam, you're you with us? I am, yes. Cool. So maybe if you want to quickly um, explain how consolidation in general and specifically for the apps works. Yeah, sure. Um, I would keep your uh, um, screen uh, open and on because I would probably need to show uh, the view, the consolidated view. Um, but again, um, consolidation can be very, very uh, complicated for some systems. And the main issue with the consolidation is that you basically either um, identify the transactions that are uh, counterparty transactions at the lowest level and at the highest level. At the highest level, it means that, so for example, you, uh, you create accounts, specific accounts. For example, you have three companies, company A, B, and C, and they, they do business together, but at the, at the end of the day, you want to consolidate everything and eliminate uh, the revenues or costs that these companies had between each other. So one very common and old way of doing it is to actually create um, elimination accounts or intercompany accounts. So basically you go and say, okay, there is, a, uh, there is an account uh, that if company A wants to sell to company B, there is an account, I'm going to call it intercompany A to B, and if someone's going to send an invoice to company B, they should use this account. And this is very easy later on to consolidate, but very hard to maintain if you have more than two, three companies. Because if, for example, you have 10 companies in a group and basically they do um, business together arbitrarily, and um, then you either have to have all the combinations of the accounts there or chuck everything into a generic intercompany account. Now, coming back to um, this um, consolidation stuff that we have, we have uh, provided for that uh, as well. And honestly, uh, maybe that's good enough for 80%, 85% of the cases, because uh, usually there is only two company or three companies and people will just create uh, one or two elimination accounts. Um, so this can be realized on uh, Actuary's side by um, adding a field um, to accounts dimension. Uh, you call it uh, intercompany, um, intercompany uh, elimination or intercompany flag. And um, if um, that um, specific account is an intercompany account, you just flag it as one. And very easily when you're then using the PNL or uh, balance sheet uh, on Power BI, you just filter everything uh, based on this uh, flag, and you say, "Okay, show me the transactions where the intercompany is not one." 
meaning that you're basically filtering out all the intercompany transactions. This is very easy to use. Um, but as I said, very um, messy to maintain for accounting. Uh, so, but um, as mentioned, this works like 80% 80, 80 of our times because that's probably um, all most of our clients need. But our uh, way of doing this um, goes a little bit deeper than this. Uh, as opposed to um, doing this top-down approach, we basically try to identify transactions at the lowest level, which is the journals. So we're going to say, okay, this journal that, for example, was created by an, um, an invoice, a sales invoice, for example, was between company A and B. So these two companies, we have uh, basically flagged them as uh, um, our, um, our subsidiaries or intercompany um, group companies. So we're going to eliminate them. And the way to do that is you can basically uh, use contact dimension. For example, if you are um, doing business only via invoices, because this happens a lot on Xero. Uh, company A sends, uh, sends an invoice or sales invoice to company B. Company B will have then this transaction as a, uh, as a purchase invoice or a bill. So um, both of them will be called invoices uh, on zero, by the way. One is called account receivable invoice, the other one account payable invoice. Now, uh, if this is the level of interaction between these two companies, it's as simple as going to the contact dimension and say, okay, company A is an intercompany contact for company B and company B is an intercompany contact for company A. And then um, we do the rest of the work because when we add the intercompany module, a new view will be created on zero. It's called con journals consolidated. So what it does, it looks at these uh, flags. And uh, basically, if it finds out, for example, company A is an intercompany uh, contact for company B, uh, it basically adds uh, the negative uh, or I mean, a negated um, value of the journals back to that view. So um, basically, they will cancel each other off. So that's at the contact level. Or uh, you may say, oh, no, uh, we have a lot of uh, manual journals going between the companies. Um, and we need to do it at that level. So contacts wouldn't necessarily capture all the um, interactions between these two companies. Then uh, we basically uh, provide um, two ways to cater for those via tracking categories or uh, basically uh, reference columns or description columns in a transaction. So you basically have to uh, follow a certain um, string pattern. Uh, for example, if you're using um, tracking categories, one of the uh, tracking category titles should be intercompany. So uh, when company A sends something or creates a journal for company B, intercompany, for example, colon, and then the company B's name. Or having something in the um, um, reference column. So you're creating a journal. In the reference um, um, field, you can just mention a, or follow a string pattern or text pattern, and then our view will recognize that as an intercompany um, transactions. I'm just I mean, there, these uh, can be defined by you, so the patterns can be something that you will or you want um, to use. There are defaults, so um, if you don't want to uh, do anything there, our default will work. And um, I'm just going to um, later on send this to the group chat. Um, you can see what uh, what defaults we're going to use. So I'm just going to send it right now. So uh, for example, for a, a reference pattern would be intercompany column. For uh, contacts, uh, the the column that uh, carries out of the box creates for contact elimination is called intercompany contact. The column that will be created in the accounts dimension is called intercompany accounts. So um, if you want us to do this elimination, we can actually um, add uh, this logic 
to your client's database. Very soon you will have a UI to do this yourself. And as I said, this creates a new view, a new data source, um, and that view already has all, everything eliminated. The only thing you need to do, and that's, that's the important part, the only thing you need to do is if you're using a, a contact-based elimination, you have to maintain the contacts dimension properly, meaning flagging the right uh, intercompany contacts. If you're doing um, account-based elimination, you have to go to the intercompany accounts and basically flag it as as, as. Um, our view, as Martin was showing, will send all the elimination transactions under a specific um, data type called, called elimination. So this is very easy then on Power BI. If you choose elimination data type plus account data type in, in Power BI under that uh, data type or scenario uh, slicer, you are basically eliminating everything. If you filter out the data type uh, that is elimination or scenario, um, elimination scenario, you get non-eliminated uh, values. So um, in this table, you can see we even have the elimination type. So what happens is that the uh, structure that we create or the view that you, you see, this actively looks at all three or four types of eliminations. Any of them present, this does the elimination. So you're not uh, limited to one type of elimination. You can do elimination by contact, at the same time elimination by account, at the same time elimination by reference color. So um, the benefit of doing everything this way, very easy to maintain. You set it up once, set and forget, and that's it. You just have to maintain for example, contacts if, if the new con a new company is added. Yeah, that was a um, small summary about the um, consolidation. Um, so I don't know if, if anybody has questions about eliminations, consolidations. If not, back to you, Martin. Thanks a lot, Martin. We're getting to the end of our time, so I will just move on. Um, so this was just a brief overview of consolidation. Sorry, um, so I, think I, George, said, uh, moment, Martin, I think Georgie, happened. Georgie was trying to say something. I had a quick question. Thanks, Hassan. Um, I just wanted to check with you: um, Are those views, those consolidated views, going to be um, included in the standard setup, uh, or uh, we still have to uh, set them up? Uh, um, look, yes. Um, it will be very soon because we're going to have a UI for it. Because uh, what we need to do is uh, add this to the um, integration or app settings page where you can um, basically just execute this and this will add the um, elimination stuff. Until then, and I don't think it will be um, uh, very long to get that. I think uh, by the end of March, we'll have them. But if you have a need to actually do this for a specific client, please open a ticket and we just add this to that specific client's database. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Hazem. So just very quickly, um, one thing that again was a bit of confusion uh, with some partners, these Power BI templates, um, we have removed the option to download them. I, I can't, no, great. <laughs> it's actually good. I can't download them either anymore uh, as, a, as a normal demo user uh, to prevent our competition from stealing them. There's obviously a lot of know-how in, uh, in these templates and, and years of, of development and we don't want to give them out freely. So you can edit in, the, uh, in Power BI web, but you don't have access to the PBAX. But for paying customers, all this is available. So as soon as they're paying customers, uh, they get access to all templates that we have. So uh, we have a we have we have a folder like this where, and this is also available to our partners, where all the uh, PBIX files are available. So for example, the, the last one for zero is this. Oh, sorry, this is here. The last one for zero is this one here. The reporting consolidation template PBIT is a 
the PBIT means it's really completely empty. It's only the report definition, and the PBIX is the is the full Power BI file. When you when you open one of these, it, it will start with asking you uh, the details relevant for your app, which is typically the most important one is the database name. So that's the only thing you need to configure these templates so that they point to your database. I'll just quickly switch the screen so that you can see this because this is opening now on a different one here. So this will look something like this. So you put in your database name, your server name, group, your group country, and then it will automatically populate the, um, the Power BI report accordingly. And then you obviously have full control. If you have the PBIX, you can do anything in there. You can add new data sources, you can do whatever you want. So this is how the templates work, but only for paying customers. Uh, the other template is the um, the Excel one. So in the downloads, you have a folder for zero templates. That is at the moment only available for Excel. Um, so you, sorry, for zero. Uh, so you open up this template. The way the configuration works here is you have, you turn on the queries and connections list and you have all the tables there that are used. And the only thing you need to do is you need to add, edit the database name. So you put in the database name. So in my case, carries one, two, three, close and load. And this will then automatically update all the uh, all the Excel reports um, with all the features that you have in Excel. So if you just click on refresh all, this will take now a minute or two. Uh, I will get now all the data from the company that I've just added before for profit and loss report, balance sheet, and exchange rates. The beauty here is now you have obviously all the features important. You have to use Microsoft account. You log on with your um, with your normal Acarius user. That's necessary the first time. Every time after, it will be automatically remembered. You have then a live link to Excel, and this is a massive benefit. All our competitors have uh, more or less limited uh, things here. We really have a live link to the database that automatically updates. So once this is configured, which takes two minutes, you have a live link to your database. If you click refresh, you will get the latest data. And of course, most importantly, it's read and write. So you can do the modeling as we've seen before, you know, add new mapping scenarios, whatever it is, but also then use all the Actaris write back features because these reports are immediately write back enabled. So if you enter directly on the pivot table, you know, on the total level, top down, or on the detail level, all the planning features are directly available uh, in Excel. Uh, again, as I said before, interestingly, not getting adopted too much. We have a few hardcore Excel customers out there, but as a percentage, it's pretty limited in comparison to the users that are just using the, the, the Power BI environment. Although this is an extremely powerful environment, in some cases way more powerful than, um, than, than Power BI because you have the cell-based option to define reports uh, because you can turn these these are pivot tables. You can turn these pivot tables into formula views, and then you know have every single value here as a formula, and then you can create reports exactly, you know, as as you want them. Um, so this just uh, quickly in regards to the Excel reporting. While this is refreshing, we have only a few more minutes left. I'll give you now the option to uh, ask um, uh, a few more questions. Uh, this is now finished here. So if I look at this, I have now the company that I've added before is here. Uh, with all the options uh, that we have. So I drill down uh, and you know all the features that are uh, available in, in Excel pivot tables plus the write back. So if I want to do my planning here, I can immediately start entering my planning data here. Obviously a little bit dangerous and I think we're restricting this already. Let me just say. Yeah. So you see for we have an automatic rule here that for everything actual it's read only. So you couldn't you couldn't change and edit the actual values here in any event. Although, as I said before, it doesn't really matter too much because uh, it would get fixed anyway on the next refresh cycle. So yeah, thank you very much, everyone, for attending. I hope this was useful for you. The session was also recorded, so you will have the option to review it um, in uh, at your own time, share it with your team. And um, you're looking forward to see you at the next session where I can't remember what the next one was, but I think we're covering planning 
topics, more detailed planning topics. Uh, so this is now more enterprise focused. Today's session was more was my apps focused, and you know we're looking forward to see you all there. Thank you very much, and have a good evening or a good day ahead. Bye bye.